Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Brian Shapiro, a technical writer at ATCC. Thank you for joining us for the latest installment in the 2017 ATCC Excellence in Research webinar series entitled Cell Culture 101, Tips for Successful Cell Culture, presented by Mr. Stephen Budd and Mr. Kevin Grady. Mr. Budd is a product line business specialist, while Mr. Grady is the product line business manager at the ATCC Cell Systems. In this presentation, Mr. Budd will cover aspects of successful cell culture such as initiation, expansion, authentication, and cryopreservation. Mr. Grady will cover topics such as cell culture workflow, the appropriate cells to use as controls, and transfection of exogenous nucleic acids into mammalian cells. If you have any questions for either of our speakers, please use the chat function available through the webinar program. All questions will be answered as time allows at the end of the presentation. Any remaining questions, as well as the recorded webinar presentation, will be archived on the ATCC website, www.atcc.org. So with that, I would like to welcome Mr. Grady. Thank you, Dr. Shapiro. Today we'll, we will provide you an overview of the best practices for common cell culture techniques. But first, a few words about ATCC. Founded in 1925, ATCC is a private, independent, not nonprofit organization that serves and supports the scientific community with industry standard products and innovative solutions. At ATCC, the core mission is to advance and apply scientific knowledge. This is done through a multifaceted approach that includes the acquisition of materials, which are either deposited or identified as a unique means of supporting scientific needs, the authentication of materials through a polyphasic approach that employs, employs genotypic, phenotypic, and functional analysis, through the preservation of materials as low passage stocks, and the development of both acquired materials and novel scientific tools that have been generated at ATCC. The products at ATCC are also standardized so that we can provide resources for generating reproducible research data. And additionally, these materials are stably distributed to both domestic and international scientific establishments. So, as I mentioned, in today's presentation, we will provide suggested best practices for choosing which cell model to use and how to best to handle the cells. Then we'll discuss transfection, its background, and how to optimize conditions. From there, we'll move to a discussion of cell viability assays. We hope this information will help your research be more positive, productive, and successful. When starting a research project, the first question is often what model to use. Depending on the research goal, that could be a continuous cell line or a primary cell. Continuous cells are easy to grow and expand, but they also have limitations. Continuous cells are generally derived from a tumor. That gives the cells their growth potential, but also means that they are not normal and therefore can be thought of as less physiologically relevant to the in vitro, in vitro situation. Primary cells are isolated from normal primary tissue and therefore offer biological and physiological relevance. However, primary cells also have their own limitations. They have a limited lifespan and culture of about 8 to 12 passages and generally require specialized culture media. ATCC offers another possible cell model. We have licensed H, the HTERT technology from Geron. This technology allows us to offer HTERT immortalized primary cells. The schematic on the left illustrates how HTERT technology works. In normal cells, as the cells grow and expand, the telomere length decreases, eventually leading to senescence. In cancer cells, there is a mutation in the telomerase gene such that the telomere sequence is not diminished, thus providing the cell with an extended and continuous lifespan. So HTERT technology 
takes that mutation and stably expresses it in primary cells. H. turn immortalized primary cells have the growth potential of a continuous cell line with the functionality of a primary cell. ATCC H. Schert cells are derived from a single clone, so a large cell number can be generated with no biological variability. So with these three possibilities, continuous cell lines, primary cells, and H. Schert immortalized primary cells, where do you start? Because you can easily generate large numbers of a continuous cell line with limited variability, you should use cell lines to establish and confirm experimental conditions. Then as you move towards the need for more specific and biological relevancy, you should bring primary cells or h turt immortalized cells into the workflow. In the screening situation, you may want to start with a continuous cell line as they are easily expanded to large quantities with limited variability and can be done at a low cost to screen a library or a large number of biomolecules. As you screen out biomolecules, you may then want to move to a model with more biological relevancy, like H. Chert immortalized primary cells, to have more predictive results because of better biological relevancy. Now with a smaller pool of biomolecules to screen, you can then move to primary cells, which offers the most biological relevance in vitro. A final note about experimental design. Continuous cell lines are derived from a tumor and can be in culture for a very long time, so they may have deviated from the original source. Therefore, in every experiment using a continuous cell line, you should run the appropriate primary cell as a control since primary cells are isolated directly from primary normal tissue. Now I will turn the agenda over to Steve, uh, who will discuss the best practices for cell handling. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Uh, we'll start by talking about, um, uh, first we're going to talk about thawing cells and go through the through this into uh, freezing down cells and then talk a little bit about contamination and issues with how to uh, deal with that. So first with thawing cells. When you're ready to thaw a bottle of cells, the most important factor to note is that unlike freezing cells, thawing should be performed as quickly as possible to remove uh, prior protectants from the cells. For best results, uh, place the vial cells in 37 degree water bath for about two to three minutes, gently agitating the vial to help break up the ice. After removing uh, the vial from the bath, make sure to spray the vial down with ethanol to prevent contamination, further contamination. Then transfer the contents of a sterile centrifuge tube with about nine mils of complete growth media, which should include about 10% FBS. When done, you can centrifuge down the tube, discard the supernatant, and then resuspend in about one to two mils of growth media to add to the desired plate. The main take on that I, uh, to clarify about thawing cells that it, there's a lot of confusion with, um, the main point is you always want to bring cells out of liquid nitrogen and thaw as quickly as possible. And for certain cells, like primary cells that Kevin mentioned uh, previously, uh, centrifugation may be detrimental, so you, you want to avoid that step. But when you ever work with the primary cell, we're referring to the very specific protocol um, for that cell. After thawing cells, uh, you're now ready to plate the cell in an appropriate vessel, which could be a cell culture dish or a flask. This all depends on your specific needs. For most cell types, the general accepted practice is to allow them to settle for about 24 hours after seeding. At this point, the cell should be checked for confluency, which is the percent coverage of cells over the surface of the vessel. If expanding cells, the idea of time to subculture is at 80% confluency. This is the, uh, this, the time it takes to reach this level is going to vary upon cell types. Primary cells may take several days or even up to a couple of weeks to get to that point. This diagram uh, gives a good visual of the different growth phases of cells in culture. When first plated, cells enter a lag phase where they grow slowly while trying to recover from the stress of subculturing. Cells then enter the exp uh, exponential phase of growth. Here cells will grow exponentially as long as growth surface is available. When this surface is completely occupied, cells, enter, cells will then enter the stationary phase of no growth. If they persist in this phase, they will then enter the decline phase in which cells will lose viability and essentially die. To ensure phenotypic stability, cell lines need to be maintained in subcultures in the exponential phase. This will need to occur, occur before a cell monolayer becomes 100% confluent or reaches its maximum recommended cell density. So this is going to be about the ideal, again, for the subculture phase is about 80% confluency. So when cells reach 80% uh, confluency, they can now be passaged with trypsin or ADTA. 
Trypsin disrupts the proteins involved in attaching cells to the culture vessel surface. The figure on the right uh, shows the progression of cells being trypsinized. At the starting point, we see cells attached as a monolayer. After trypsin is added, the cells start to become less flat and more round. When they're completely detached, they can be seen floating around in clusters at the, at the top of the cell culture media. This process should take about three to five minutes, but make sure to note that the dish should be agitated to help detach the cells. Long-term exposure of trypsin to cells can be detrimental, so the time, trypsin, the time cells are exposed to trypsin should be minimized. I also note that if using primary cells, a special lower concentration formula of about 0.05% trypsin, 0.002% EDTA should be used. Primary cells are very sensitive to trypsin, and in this case, physical agitation of the cell culture dish is definitely needed for, att for attachment. When trypsinization is complete, the reaction needs to be quenched, ideally with a soybean neutralizing solution. Again, this will, this will help protect the cells from any damage of long-term exposure to trypsin. Uh, for the next several slides, uh, we want to discuss techniques and best practices uh, in cryopreservation. I want to first go over the basic theory behind cryopreservation and how it works. The freezing process is a complex phenomenon that has been studied for decades. Since water is the most important component in living cells, cellular metabolism stops when all water is turned to ice. This freezing process, however, is largely, is largely detrimental to, cells, to the cell's health. The biggest factor that determines the occurrence of cell damage and how this damage can be mediated is the rate of cooling. When cells are frozen rapidly, water and ions tend to remain in the cell. This will minimize solute concentration effects, i.e. osmotic imbalance, and reduce dehydration. However, intracellular ice formation is maximized, causing intracellular damage through, the me uh, through mechanical action of tearing and piercing the cells. Conversely, if uh, cells are frozen slowly, Water outside the cell freezes before intracellular ice forms. This can cause water to escape by osmosis. The cells become dehydrated and the concentration of solutes increase, but the formation of intracellular ice crystals is minimized. Extracellular ice does form, but is far less damaging. In effect, very fast and very slow freezing rates have consequences, either in excessive ice formation or increased solute effects. Cryoprotectants, most commonly DMSO, encourage dehydration, minimize ice crystallization, and reduce solution effects. For most cells, the optimal rate of freezing is between 1 and 3 degrees Celsius per minute. As you can see in the diagram shown, is this, at this temperature range, the negative impact of intracellular ice formation is at equilibrium with increased solute concentration. This is maximizing cell viability. Freezing cells is typically a two-stage process in which cells are incubated, incubated for some time at around minus 70 degrees Celsius before being stored permanently at minus 140 degrees Celsius. As previously stated, cells must be cooled at a rate of about minus 1 degrees per minute at minus 70 degree in a, in a freezer at minus 70 degrees Celsius. This is achieved with the reuse of a controlled rate freezer or controlled rate chamber. The length of time needed in the minus 70 would depend on the type of chamber used. After spending some time at minus 70, usually a few hours to 24 hours, the valves must be transferred to minus 140 degrees Celsius for long-term storage. The best recommended storage container is liquid nitrogen tanks. As I just stated, for long-term storage of mammalian cells, um, it's required that they be exposed to temperatures below minus 140 degrees Celsius. At these low temperatures, metabolic activity ceases, allowing for the preservation of cells for an indefinite period of time. For storing biological material at these low temperatures, it is highly advisable to use liquid nitrogen containers. There are two basic types of liquid, uh, liquid nitrogen storage practices. One is immersing the valves directly in the liquid. The other involves holding the valves in the vapor phase above the liquid. Vapor phase systems create a vertical temperature gradient within the container. At the bottom, the liquid nitrogen will maintain a temperature of around minus 196 degrees Celsius. The temperature of the vapor, uh, the vapor phase decreases as it reaches the top portion of the container. 
Enough liquid should be used to guarantee that the warmest part of the container at the top is always at a temperature uh, at or under minus 140 degrees Celsius. It is highly recommended that valves be stored in the vapor phase rather than the liquid. Since metabolic activity is arrested at minus 140 degrees, the, addition of cold, the additional cold temperatures of the liquid phase offers no real advantage. However, immersing material in the liquid phase runs the risk that some of the liquid nitrogen could penetrate and damage the, valve, the plastic valves. So as we leave the discussion on cryopreservation, I want to discuss cell characterization as it relates to our upcoming topic of general cell health, contamination, and authentication. It is necessary to characterize cells to determine how healthy and viable they are, as well as making sure they're the cells, they're actually the cells you think they are. Simple cell count, uh, simple cell viability counts using tripan blue with the hemocytometer is an easy way to determine the percentage of live cells over dead cells. With this method, live cells appear to have bright centers, while dead cells appear to be dark blue as the dye penetrates the compromised membrane. Often when researchers receive cells from collaborators or unreliable sources, they may find the cells are not, are not what they think they are. Checking morphology is a quick way to distinguish broad cell types from one another. In the example on the right, two cell types, fibroblasts and cubex, which are human umbilical vein and ethereal cells, have very distinct morphologies. Fibroblasts tend to be elongated, whereas cubex tend to have a rounded cobblestone appearance. So be attentive of the expected morphology of the cell that you're using. And, this, and use that to help determine um, if, you're, if the cells you're working with are really the, the proper cells. Also, since different cell types uh, grow at different rates, you always make sure that your cells are growing in the way that you would expect. For instance, if cells are contaminated with another fast-growing cell line, the growth rate and doubling time may be greatly increased. We'll further discuss more sophisticated and definitive ways of authentication and authenticating cells later in the webinar. So I'm going to uh, devote some time talking about contamination in the next few slides and how to detect it and how to avoid it. Uh, the main types of contamination in cell culture that we're going to be concerned with are microbial, which includes bacteria, mycoplasm, and mycoplasm, uh, fungus, and viruses. There is also cellular contamination, meaning one cell type or cell line has invaded another in culture. We'll discuss this in a little bit more detail uh, later on. Bacterial and fungal contamination are the most commonly uh, seen problem in labs. They can occur quickly, but fortunately are also easily detected. Turbid and acidic media usually indicate the presence of bacteria. Cell stress from microbial contamination may also lead to morphological changes. Fungal contamination is seen by the appearance of obvious filament, uh, filamentous structures in the media. So at least one thing about this kind of microbial contamination is that it's uh, easy, microbial and fungal contamination is that it's easily detectable. Mycoplasma and cellular cross-contamination, however, discussed a little bit later, is not going to be as easy to detect. Mycoplasma contamination is uh, the separate issue we're talking about that is very easy to or very hard to detect in media. Contamination from mycoplasma can cause a host of problems that include altering the cell's function, growth and morphology, causing chromosomal aberrations, affect nucleic acid synthesis, and changes in membrane, antigens, and gene expression. The main source of mycoplasma contamination is receiving infected cultures from other research laboratories or cell culture media or reagents that are uh, commercially available. Cross-contamination uh, cross of one cell type for another. So when you deal with this, if the contamination is particularly a fast-growing cell, the original cell line can be gradually replaced with the invading cells. As a result, over a period of time, an entire cell line in one's depository can be completely overwritten and replaced with the new invading cell. Morphology is often not reliable to distinguish the original and invading cell in, in many cases. There are several common causes for this kind of contamination. Researchers often contaminate their own cell lines by working with multiple cell lines that were cell types at a time. This often occurs when using the same pipette tip or aspirator within vessels containing different cell types. We recommend only working with one cell line at a time under the hood if at all possible to avoid this. 
Another way of contamination is that researchers may often receive cell lines from other labs that were not they're already cross-contaminated without being aware of that. The importance of this cannot be understated. It has been estimated that 20% of scientific publications in the past have used misidentified cultures. This also has resulted in 50% of preclinical research being non-reproducible. Mycoplasma contamination can be detected through a number of available kits on the market. The Universal Mycoplasma Detection Kit from ATCC is a PCR-based kit that can detect 60% of, of the most common mycoplasma species. To put this in perspective, over 90% of contamination is caused by just a few species. The Mycoplasma Detection Kit uh, comes with primers specific to mycoplasma with mycoplasma DNA used as control. To test for mycoplasma, simply collect and lyse cells from your culture, perform the test on PCR, and run the product in the gel. If the cell culture is contaminated, a band will appear at the same location as a positive control. As a service, ATCC offers cell on authentication utilizing short tandem repeat profiling. STR profiling helps to detect misidentified, cross-contaminated, or genetically drifted cells which invade research results. To take advantage of this service, simply receive a report that includes the STR profile of your cell line, the comparison of your cells against an STR profile database, electrophorograms supporting the allele, the allele cell, uh, calls at each cell lo uh, loci, and a complete interpretation of your results. So now I want to talk about contamination as uh, where, it, where it comes from and how to help prevent it. For starters, anything that has been contaminated in the past can contaminate cells going forward. Media and reagents that are not handled correctly can easily be a vehicle to introduce, introduce bacteria and fungus into cell cultures. Using items such as petri dishes, pipette tips that are not sterilized can certainly introduce contaminants. Personnel can also introduce, introduce particulates and aerosols on personal clothing or even on dry skin. Improperly maintained equipment can prevent uh, pre improperly maintained equipment can prevent protection from the entry of contaminants. Overpacking autoclaves or ovens can even cause problems when uneven heating, creating pockets of non-sterile supplies in the oven. The flow rate of hoods, if not properly adjusted, can allow particulates to enter. So what can you do to make sure cells and culture do not get contaminated? So I'm going to point out a few tips that may uh, prevent contamination. First, uh, make it hard for any contaminants to enter your cell culture vessels. Small dishes, such as 35 to 60 mil uh, millimeter dishes, over larger ones can be placed in large ones within the incubator. So you have that addition, you have the small dishes stacked in larger ones to sort of act as a protective barrier. And when using flasks, it is recommended to use vented caps that can be sealed tightly to still allow gas exchange. I always use disposable aspirators and pipette tips that are pre-sterilized. Make sure that your hood has adequate laminar flow and never overcrowd or leave materials such as boxes or bottles in the hood indefinitely. This can impede proper flow and block attempts at cleaning and wiping down the hood surface. When bringing media and reagents into the hood, always spray the items down with alcohol to remove any contaminants. It is advisable to bring in small amounts of reagents at a time to the hood. If possible, you may want to aliquot small amounts in containers to reduce the number of times you bring a possible contaminated object into the hood. Uh, for instance, if a vial is already contaminated, uh, at least you won't be bringing it time after time into the workspace. Always remember to wear clean lab coats that cover most of your arms to prevent dust and shedding skin to contaminate your cultures. We mentioned this before, to revisit, you should always avoid using uh, antibiotics and antibiotics in culture. There are a few reasons in addition to uh, the potential for toxicity. If you use no, uh, media with no antibiotics or antimycotics, and if contamination enters your cell cultures, chances are it will be visible within a few days. You can then destroy and discard the infected dishes. However, if antibiotics are present, it may slow the growth of the contaminant, allowing uh, you to further passage and freeze down your, cells, your cell lines. In short, you may be saving large amounts of contaminated cells that can cause problems, that can cause problems further down the road. Resistant mycoplasma may also get introduced along with other bacteria. 
The antibiotics may get rid of the larger bacteria, but mycoplasma will persist. When is it acceptable to use antibiotics? A few exceptions may make it necessary. For instance, if you're isolating primary cells from original tissue, it may be a good idea to use antibiotics for the first couple of weeks. Uh, so now I'm going to um, switch and talk about some best practices with media choices and additives you can put into your cell culture media. Com uh, complete growth media refers to cell culture media, various ingredients and additives, and animal serum. In this session, we will go over these uh, fundamental components and give advice and guidance on how to manipulate growth media by adding additional ingredients, and also when not to add any additional ingredients uh, components to your cell culture media. The basic component of growth media is, of course, the actual basal cell media. There are eight recognized media formulas that are commonly referred to as classical cell culture media. Uh, this media is comprised of a mixture of salts, carbohydrates, vitamins, amino acids, metabolic precursors, growth factors, hormones, and trace elements. The differences in formulations between these eight medium arose to uh, the specific requirements of different cell lines. Most human and animal cell lines can be cultured with these basic uh, media types in FBS. Primary cells, uh, which are far more finicky, require special media that is formulated specifically for a cell type. This, uh, they usually come as a basal media specific to the cell with additional growth factors and serums added as kits. Uh, be aware that when purchasing primary cells, follow advice giving selection of media. And we now want to focus on some other additives that researchers often choose to add to media and give some advice on why you should or should not use this. Um, also, culture media contains the essential amino acids. Non-essential amino acids can be added to media that may often reduce the metabolic burden on cells and allow for further increases in cellular proliferation. Now, the general rule is to follow the cell-specific protocol to determine if this is needed. There are some other components that researchers tend to add to media that can have a uh, deleterious effect. L-glutamine is an essential amino acid needed in cell culture. However, it does tend to be more unstable than other amino acids. Because of this, researchers may spike their media with glutamine to ensure enough is available. We recommend to take caution when doing this because L-glutamine does degrade into ammonia. So if you add more L-glutamine, more ammonia will form as it breaks down. Studies, show, studies have shown that for sealed bottles of media uh, stored at typically 4 to 8 degrees Celsius, protected from light, L-glutamine uh, degrades very slowly over time. You can buy media without L-glutamine and add it right before use, but when you do this, you have to worry about measurement issues and inconsistency. So we generally recommend uh, to just use media already applied with L-glutamine and keep it protected from light and, re and refrigerated. As, uh, antibiotics and antimycotics are also really not recommended. I mentioned before about why it may not be useful to guarantee um, to prevention of bacterial and fungal growth. But in addition, they can also be toxic to cells and aren't really going to guarantee the sterility that I mentioned. It, it is always advisable to keep cell cultures in the same media. Quickly changing out cell cultures from one media type to the next can result in, among other negative side effects, osmotic shock. If it is necessary to switch media types, do it in a stepwise solution. Start with a mix of old and new media, 50% each, and gradually transfer to, to the newer media. For the next round, use the old to new mix at a mix of 1 to 2, then 1 to 3, and 1 to 7, before completely transferring it to the new media. Uh, the ATTC Animal Cell Culture Guide has this protocol in detail. For all animal serum, we generally recommend that you do not use heat inactivated FBS unless there is a good reason. Heat inactivation is shown to be detrimental to growth, hormone, to growth factors and hormones. Our recommendations to uh, heat inactivated serum have been based on the need to inactivate the immune complement. This really is only useful for certain uh, applications, such as using cells to assay viruses. So now I'm going to um, hand it back over to Kevin. He's going to talk about transfection and analysis issues. All right. Thank you, Steve. Okay, as Steve's mentioned, the next section is going to talk about transfection. So what is transfection? So transfection is a common process used to introduce foreign or exogenous nucleic acids into cells. 
No single approach will work for all conditions, cell types, or application. In the next slide, I'll discuss the various transfection methods that have been developed. Um, some of the methods involve simple cell culture methods, and others will involve the use of expensive equipment. Okay, so there's a list of all the basic transfection types on the left. Uh, the first one, lipid transfection, is the most common, least expensive, and the easiest method to run. Basically, it involves complexing the lipid to the DNA or RNA of interest, and then incubating the complex with your cell culture. We're going to discuss this technique in greater detail in a few minutes. Moving down the list, viral methods um, are next. And viral methods are a bit more challenging than lipid transfection. First, the cells you are looking to transfect must have the receptors for the viruses that are being used. Your viral constructs are then generated in packaging cells, then collected from those cultures, and then subsequently added to the cultures of the cells wished to be transfected. You may have to do various rounds of packaging to get the infectivity of your viral stock high enough that you'll get an efficient transfection. So you can see it's a little, little bit more challenging than the lipid transfection. The next method on the list is electroporation. And electroporation actually involves a device that delivers an electrical pulse to your cells. Uh, the electrical pulse opens pores in the cell membrane, allowing the DNA or RNA to move through the pores into the cell. One of the negative features of this method is high cell mortality post-transfection. So this method is really only used, used for hardy continuous cell lines that you can grow, in, grow into large cell numbers. The next method are physical methods. And this is, uh, these methods usually uh, involve equipment that are actually used to penetrate the cell membrane. A common example of this is microinjection, which uses a needle to deliver the nucleic acid to the cell. The equipment is very expensive, requires a lot of training, and can also only process one cell at a time. So it's a very laborious process and very limited uh, use in the lab. Another physical method is ballistics, which, as it sounds, involves a device called a gene gun that shoots sub subcellular particles that are coated with the nucleic acid into the cells. This method, again, uh, the device can be fairly expensive, and this method is generally only used in plant cells as this is the only method that can penetrate plant cell walls. However, it can be used in mammalian systems, and those systems would be ones where you're looking at non-dividing cell types like neurons, uh, which will become apparent why that's the case in the next slide when I discuss lipid transfection. This device, as I mentioned, is also costly and does require high cell numbers again due to the high mortality post-transfection. There's some other methods that have been developed in the, most, in the last couple of years. Uh, but they haven't really gained a lot of common use. One that did actually, ha that is starting to gain some traction in the lab is where you uh, take nucleic acid and coat it onto metal particles and then use a magnet to pull the particles into the monolayer. As I mentioned, these methods, these newer methods have not been around very long and as such there aren't very many optimized protocols for different cell types. Okay, so this schematic details how lipid transfections work, and as I mentioned, this is the technology that we're going to focus on for most of the talk. Um, when I start talking about the various procedures or points to consider for lipid transfection, they generally also uh, are involved in other cell types or other transfection types also. So this is simply, in lipid transfection, it's simply based on the concept of opposites attract. The nucleic acid has a net negative charge. The cationic lipid micelles, the transfection reagent, has a positive charge. The, the nucleic acid and lipids are allowed to form a complex which now has a net positive charge because of the cationic lipid micelles coating the all surfaces of the DNA molecules or the RNA molecules, thus giving it a net positive charge. Cells in culture have a net negative charge. So the positively charged nuclei, nucle nucleic acid uh, and lipid complex moves to the negatively charged cell membrane. The complex is then either engulfed by the cell membrane or the lipids of the complex diffuse into the cell me membrane. But through either method, the, the nucleic acid eventually gets across the cell membrane and into the cytoplasm. 
If the nucleic acid is RNA, its effect takes place in the cytoplasm, so essentially your transfection is done. If the nucleic acid is DNA, for its effect it needs to get into the nucleus. This happens when the cell undergoes mitosis, the nuclear membrane breaks down, and hopefully the DNA that's trapped, the DNA gets trapped in the nuclei of the newly formed daughter cells. This entrapment in the daughter cell nuclei is somewhat random. So to increase the likelihood of this happening, you want to use the most efficient delivery system method available. ATCC offers two transfection reagents for the delivery of plasma DNA, GeneX Plus and Transfex. GeneX Plus is a good choice for suspension cells. However, Transfex can be thought of as an all-purpose transfection reagent. We have developed optimized protocols for many continuous cell lines and primary cells. These protocols can be found on our website or by contacting technical services. Here's a typical transfection workflow. So you, you start off with, um, so as I mentioned, it, it uses basic cell culture techniques. So you start off with cells that are very healthy and in mid-log phase growth and should be about at 70% confluent on the day of transfection. The nucleic, acid complex, the nucleic acid is allowed to complex with the transfection reagent. This generally takes about 15 to 30 minutes, depending on the transfection reagent. Then the complex is added to the cell culture. Gene expression can be analyzed then in 18 to 96 hours post-transfection. The time of analysis is going to be dependent upon what you're expressing. Uh, for example, a surface protein may take longer to be, to be able to be detected than a cytoplasmic protein, since a surface protein has to travel through the cell before being able to be detected. Also, how you're analyzing will, will affect the optimal time for analysis, and we'll discuss that in detail in a few minutes. Lipid transfection can be used to manipulate the cells to either overexpress a protein via the delivery of plasma DNA or mRNA, and lipid transfection can also be used to, d to deliver interfering RNA to knock down the expression of a specific protein. This can allow for this, the, the use of these two technologies can allow for the e easy study and elucidation of different pa biological pathways. Transient, or the question of uh, transient or stable transfection uh, comes up. So transfection can be used to create either form of expression. Transient expression occurs when the plasma DNA enters the nucleus, but does not incorporate into the cell's own genome. As the cells divide and expand, the expression level will decrease as the transfected genetic material is not being passed from generation to generation during cell division. In a stable transfection, the DNA is randomly incorporated into the cell's genome. For stable transfections, one uses a plasma that has your gene of interest along with an antibiotic selection marker, like neomycin or pyromycin resistance. Through repeated cycles of antibiotic selection post-transfection, you eventually get clones that have incorporated your gene of interest and the resistance gene. Depending how fast your cells grow, the selection process could take two to three months. There are many aspects to optimize when one is establishing a transfection protocol, and I'll discuss each of these in detail. But these areas include culture conditions, nucleic acid, choice of nucleic acid, experimental setup, analysis method, and the choice of transfection reagent. Good health is vital to, good, to a good transfection. Cells must be free of contamination. Mycoplasma contamination can lead to diminished transfection efficiency. Cells should also be at a low passage number as possible and in mid-log phase growth. Also, the confluency should be between 60 to 70 percent at the time of transfection. Suspension cells should be at approximately 5 times 10 to the fifth cells per mil. As for media choices, the complexes can be formed in a serum, should be uh, formed in a serum-free media, uh, such as Optimem, which is from, available from Thermo Fisher. The complexes should be added to the cells in growth media uh, without heparin, as it interferes with the complex's ability to bind to the cell membrane. Regarding nucleic acids, uh, for a successful transfection, the nucleic acid should be of high purity and endotoxin-free. The nucleic acid should also be validated for full-length sequence. For plasma DNA, one should try several promoters as the promoter's effectiveness often depends on the cell type. 
CMV and the F1 Alpha are generally considered to be strong promoters and good all-around promoters and therefore a good place to start. Plasmid size is also a concern as large plasmids, those greater than 15 kb, may not be as effectively delivered as smaller plasmids. For RNA interference, it is a good idea to use pooled siRNAs instead of a single sequence. This will allow for more efficient knockdown and less off-target effects. A few notes about experimental design. Uh, DNA and RNA lengths should be verified uh, bef before use as improper storage can often lead to nicked or degraded DNA or RNA. If you're trying for a stable transfection, you may get better incorporation if you use linearized DNA rather than coiled DNA. You should always use a positive control such as an empty GFP plasmid or RNAi for housekeeping gene like GAP-DH. For a negative control, you can, all, you can use an empty plasmid or scrambled siRNA. DNA or lipids can themselves be toxic, so you should have a condition with only DNA or RNA added and one with only lipid added. Toxicity can show up as cell death or morphological changes. And you should always run your assay with replicates to confirm your results. Post-transfection assay methods can be done at the RNA level as well as the protein level. We'll discuss some more specifics on the next slide. Uh, one can also, and one can also look for changes in morphology or run more functional assays. So for all substrates, you should run a time point analysis as the optimal time will vary from substrate and cell type. Remember, remember for plasma DNA, you need to allow for mitosis to occur before running your analysis. Analysis of mRNA transfections for protein expression can be done 12 to 36 hours post-transfection. For protein detection, 24 to 72 hours post-transfection should be okay, as, but the optimal time will depend on the protein com complexity, stability, and the analysis method being employed. When using RNAi, your optimal analysis time will depend on the half-life of the protein being knocked down and your analysis method. So that can be anywhere from 4 to 30 hours. Uh, finally, some conditions for uh, considerations regarding the trans choice of transfection reagent. Every transfection reagent will come with generally suggested volumes of reagent and nucleic acid and a recommended incubation time for, complex for complexing to allow the complex to be in contact with the cells. However, different cell types may require different conditions, so you should always try a few different DNA lipid ratios. We provide an optimization scheme on our website, and you should also make note that incubation time can also vary on reagent and cell type. So best practices in summary for transfection. To get the most efficient transfection, you're going to want to use healthy cells that are in mid-log phase growth. Your plasmid should have a strong promoter applicable to your cell of interest, be endotoxin-free, and full length. The transfection reagent should be chosen based upon the cell type, suspension or adherent, and, is, and the substrate being delivered. So there are certain uh, transfection reagents out there that are recommended for suspension versus adherent cells, and also ones that are recommended for plasma DNA or RNA. And the DNA lipid ratio or the RNA lipid ratio should be optimized for each cell type. Now I'll turn the presentation back to Steve, who will discuss viability assays. Uh, thanks, Kevin. So we're going to uh, end the, the last part of the webinar is going to discuss viability assays and, and um, measure growth and viability. So here we previously talked about how to measure viability using uh, the Tripen Blue simple cell count. This is a method in which uh, viability assays are methods in which you can measure the number of cells uh, in a well and, and measure its current rate of growth. This is ideal uh, for assays in which you would want to compare normal growing cells against an experimental factor, such as a cytotoxin, that would negatively affect growth. There are two assays that we currently have that uh, do this, the MTT and the XTT cell proliferation assays. They both utilize tetrazoleum salts to deliver a quantitative analysis of cell culture. Both assays utilize a colometric plate reader for analysis. The two assays are very similar in nature. They differ by 
potent species of salt used and, and it's a slightly different um, protocol and, and, and slightly different way of, of, of working. This slide is a diagram that shows exactly how these salts work inside the cell. So imagine in this case the blue spheres are cells, the gray inner spheres are the nucleus. With the NTT assay, the tetrazoleum salt is introduced into the cell. Naturally occurring oxidation reactions within the cell, indicative of normally growing cells, will reduce the tetrazoleum into formazin. The cells are then lysed with detergents, releasing the formazin and giving off a purple color. The more purple the media, the more metabolically active and growing the cells, will be, uh, the cells present will be. So this assay is a good for measuring things, again, like things like size, cytotoxicity and apoptosis. The XCT reaction is a very similar process. The only main difference is the reaction occurs at the surface. The XCT re uh, reaction gives off an orange color as an indicator. The forms in salt in this case doesn't directly enter the cell but measures oxidation along the surface of the cell membrane. And so this uh, diagram here sort of gives you a working idea of what the assay actually looks like in practice. Both assays are designed for, idealized for 96 well plates. And here in this overview, um, both assays are plated with the, cytotoxic, with the cytotoxic test compound. When the MTT reagent at the top, uh, there is an incubation period to allow the reagent to enter the cell. There is a, a detergent added that allows for the compound to be released into the media. In this case, the cell is lysed. At this point, there could be an incubation period for a few hours for the reaction to complete. After this uh, process, uh, during the incubation period, again, this, the, you see the change in media, and the more the cells are growing, the better they're growing, uh, the more, change, the, more the, the, uh, the apparent change in the, in the color of the purple media is going to be. With the XCT reaction, the XCT reagent and activation agent are added in one step. And the reaction starts almost immediately. So the real benefit of the XCT kit is that this one less step in the protocol which will knock off a couple of hours in the reaction. So with the XCT kit, as soon as it's applied, there's an incubation period of a few hours for the, uh, for the full reaction to take place. So after, when you're reading your results, you read, you take the, the plate, you take the 96 wheel plate, read it on the plate reader. This graph shows an example of sort of the readout. This is on the, on the graph you see absorbance versus plotted versus cell number. So when you, when you take the absorbance reading, the absorbance is directly related to the number of cells per well. Um, um, one issue with this is, the, as you see, the absorbance will eventually saturate and no longer indicate cell number over a period of time. So for instance, um, if you look at the top line, which is the XCT reaction, you can take a reading of the absorbance between about roughly 1 and 3. And anything past that, uh, you can't really get a good cell reading. So they sort of interpret this uh, with the MTT kit. You're going to see a, a um, reading between 5,000 and 15,000 cells will give you is, is the range in which you can detect. With the XCT reaction, it's going to be a lot more. So to sort of sum up uh, what we've talked about this far, um, Kevin introduced the webinar talking about the differences between primary cells and cell lines and when you can use those in conjunction and which is with. They also introduced the concept of the age toward immortalized cells. Uh, we then talked about a lot of uh, cell health issues with thawing and crack preservation. Make sure you always thaw quickly and freeze slowly. Uh, contamination issues, uh, always characterize your cells to make sure they're healthy and growing properly and make sure that you have the cells you're working with are the proper cells. Uh, Kevin Newman is talking about transfection reagents and the different types of transfection, lipids, viral, liquidation, physical. He went into detail about the lipid, uh, lipid transfection process and the protein analysis. And we finished up talking about viability assays and how they measure the actual number of cells in cell culture and can measure against cytotoxic agents. Uh, I'd like to Thank you again for the excellent presentation, and thank you everyone for attending the presentation today. Any questions that were not answered this afternoon, and we've had quite a few come in, uh, will be answered and posted with the video 
at www.atcc.org. And please join us for more webinars in the ATCC Excellence in Research webinar series. Thank you again, and have a great day.